Hello and welcome to the Daily News Simplified. The what, why and how of the newspaper analysis from a civil service examination's perspective. Today, we are going to discuss the Hindu Daily edition dated 11th May 2023. The important topics which are to be discussed have been displayed on your screen and a timestamping of the same has been provided in the description box below. So now, let us begin our today's session. So before starting our today's session, let us have a look on the question for mains weekly answer writing practice. The question is from the Constitution, Polity and Governance section. The question says, what is the criteria for the inclusion of a community into a list of scheduled tribes? What are the potential benefits of including a particular community into the scheduled tribe list? And how this inclusion can impact the social, economic and political well-being of both the community and the wider society? So you have to answer this question within the word limit of 250 words. So try to brainstorm all the possible dimensions, write beautiful answers and upload it on the eLearn platform and get it evaluated by our evaluation experts. So let us begin with our first topic. This topic might look very small in size, but it is an important topic because it talks about an important disaster, which is the heat waves. The immediate context of this very article deals with the city of Ahmedabad where the temperature has risen till 43 degrees Celsius and therefore municipal corporation has issued an orange alert asking the citizens to stay indoors and remain hydrated. Now as far as the UPSC scheme of syllabus is concerned this topic is mainly relevant under two sections. One is general studies mains paper 1 in the section of geography. Second is general studies mains paper three in the topic of disaster management. Moreover, if you go by the previous year question paper analysis, just in 2022, that is in the mains of last year, the question was asked in relation to the tropical cyclones. The question said that discuss the meaning of color coded weather warnings for cyclone prone areas given by IMD. So therefore, in this heat waves also because the context has mentioned the color coded warning system, we shall understand that what are various color coded weather warning systems developed by IMD in regard of the heat waves. So in this session, we are going to discuss the criteria for heat waves that what exactly are heat waves and when do we consider that particular area is experiencing a heat wave. This is very factual, but more important in today's session will be to discuss this science, to discuss this phenomena that how heat waves are developed. Then we will also look at how to cope up with the heat waves and what are various color coded warning systems given by IMD. So first is the criteria for heat waves. Now I will not be discussing this in very detail because this is very factual and has been discussed in DNS a lot of times. The only thing is that if you have to understand the heat waves, by the name you can understand that the temperature in a particular area will be relatively higher compared to the normal or the average value. So this average value will be different. For example, it will be different for plains, it will be different for hills, it will be different for coasts. And that is why a uniform temperature degree will not be applicable for all the types of physiography to declare that particular region as experiencing a heat waves. It will be area wise area basis. And that is why IMD says that it is 40 degrees Celsius or more for plains, 37 for coastal stations, 30 degrees Celsius for hilly regions. Then there are two different factors based on the departure from the normal or based on the actual maximum temperature. For example, when it comes to the actual maximum temperature, the heat wave will be considered when the actual maximum temperature is 45 degrees Celsius, severe heat wave will be 47 degrees Celsius. So all these are the factual details, just go through them. We shall now move towards the concept of heat wave that how these heat waves are developed. So there will be few important concepts while understanding the heat waves. The first concept will be the relation between temperature as well as pressure. Now generally the temperature is inversely proportional to the pressure that is when the temperature will increase the pressure will decrease and that is why when we talk about let's say equatorial regions where there is higher insulation and there is higher temperature because the air gets warmed and it moves upward making this particular region as a low pressure area. 
the reason being that hot air is lighter and therefore it rises up the second important concept to deal with the adiabatic changes now what are adiabatic changes let's say the air parcel is moving up so when it will move up it will experiencing a lower pressure by the atmosphere correct because the atmospheric pressure will be highest on the surface of the earth because here it is having a largest thickness as the air particle will move up this thickness will relatively reduce and therefore the pressure will also get reduced and hence this air particle will try to expand its volume so as the air particle will rise up it will expand its volume and therefore it will cool down on the contrary whenever any air parcel is coming down it will be reducing it will be shrinking its volume as you can see here at the top level it is having a higher volume as it moves down it will be having a lower volume reason is same because as soon as it reaches the earth surface the pressure is acting on the air parcel by the atmosphere and it is continuously compressing that air particle and therefore it is reducing its volume so as the air particle will come down it will heat up the reason being that molecules in the lower volume will hit each other will produce friction and will generate heat but when the air particle is rising up because their spaces between the molecules is also increasing because the volume of the air particle is also increasing and hence lower friction lower heat and therefore cooling so remember this whenever any air parcel is coming down it will heat itself because of the adiabatic changes the third concept which will be relevant for this is the concept of jet streams now we all know that jet streams are basically the circumpolar meandering winds in the upper atmosphere generally they move from west to east and most important of these jet streams are the subtropical westerly jet streams so these jet streams also create pressure differences on the earth's surface near the trough on the eastern part it will be a low pressure and this crest or the ridge part here it will be the high pressure right which means that if the jet stream is passing over a land surface and it is having a trough over a particular area then that particular area will be experiencing low pressure and if any particular region is having a ridge of the jet stream that area will be having the high pressure and fourth and last concept which will be important in understanding the heat waves is the relation between the clouds as well as the insulation so this is very obvious whenever there is a lesser amount of clouds present in the atmosphere there will be higher amount of insulation which will reach to the earth surface because here now we don't have clouds and the solar insulation will directly hit the earth surface now if this four concepts are clear to you now we can easily understand the heat waves so now let us see that how these heat waves are formed let us imagine that this particular region is the earth's surface under consideration so generally these are the months in which india faces the heat waves now let us examine that what are the wind circulations over india in this particular month that is in the month of april and may so during these months what happens is that still there is a presence of subtropical westerly jet streams in the manner like this so this is the manner in which the jet streams are still flowing over this particular region and now because india is experiencing this rich conditions which means that in these particular areas in the northwestern part of india as well as pakistan on the earth surface we still have the high pressure region and in india relatively we experience low pressure region and that is why as we all know that winds will tend to move from high towards low so basically during these months the winds are north westerly over the northern india reason is the presence of the ridge of subtropical westerly jet streams second important reason is that still because we are in a transition phase and just few months back there was a winter phase during winters the central asian region experiences very high pressure so obviously now we have entered into the summer season but still the wind directions are from the northwest towards the southeast 
so because of these two reasons the winds are moving from let's say pakistan towards india so now come to this particular diagram what is happening let's say the sun is heating the earth surface because now we have entered into the summer seasons and there is a continuous heating of the earth surface because of this continuous insulation this air particle will get warmed up and it will try to escape but eventually what will happen it will not be able to escape the reason being the presence of high pressure because of the jet streams over this particular region these jet streams will not allow the warm air to expand and to get moved rather this jet stream will keep on compressing the winds present in this atmosphere so it will keep on pressurizing this air particle and therefore the winds which were expected to rise because of the high temperature will eventually come down and when these wind particles will come down we have read that the adiabatic changes will lead to increase in the temperature so that means now as the wind particle is coming down it is increasing its temperature so what is happening here we were already having the warm air which was trapped because of the presence of high pressure conditions over in the atmosphere and the winds which are coming from above to down it is also increasing its temperature so because of this this complete region will experience a very high temperature further because now winds are descending over this particular region and we know that whenever the winds descend there is an anti cyclonic condition whenever we have anti cyclonic condition it means that stable atmospheric conditions exist now if we are having a stable atmospheric conditions it will mean that the atmosphere will not be having cloud it will be a cloudless condition so here we do not have clouds and because of which the solar insulation also comes the intensity of the solar insulation increases so all these combination of factors lead to the heat waves over a particular region the role of jet streams is very important when it comes to the heat waves over the india's northern part now if you have understood this very concept try to brainstorm and link that how similar condition that the presence of jet stream is also responsible for the burst of monsoon in india because the concept will remain same in this line now let us look that what are the color coded warning systems given by imd in regard to the heat waves so there are particularly three color codes given by imd one is the green color second is yellow and third is orange the green color says that it is a normal day there is no presence of heat waves and that is why maximum temperatures are near the normal so no cautionary action is required when it comes to the yellow alert that is be updated heat alert is transmitted by the imd and it says that there are heat wave conditions at isolated pockets persist on two days moderate temperature heat is tolerable for general public but moderate health concern do exist especially for the infants elderly people and people with chronic diseases and that is why the suggested actions during the yellow alert conditions is avoid the heat exposure wear light weight light colored loose cotton clothes covering the head using a cloth hat or umbrella and the severe most category is the orange alert that is the severe heat alert for the day severe heat wave conditions persist for 2 days and heat waves may persist for 4 days or more high temperature increased and likelihood of heat illness symptoms and now not just the vulnerable people will be affected the normal the general public will also be affected the suggested actions during the orange alert is avoid the heat exposure keep cool and stay hydrated drink sufficient water even if not thirsty use ors homemade drinks like lassi rice water lemon water etc the point is that you should keep yourself hydrated so these are three color code based warning systems given by imd in relation to the heat waves now what are the effects or the impacts of heat waves 
So as you can see in this particular diagram, heat waves affect virtually each and every sphere as well as aspect of our life. It has its detrimental effect on agriculture, it affects the transport, it affects the overall economy, the health as well as the environment. For example, if we have to talk about environment, the heat waves will lead to rapid melting of glaciers, warming of waters, which will in turn lead to decreased yields of fishes and will also affect the biodiversity. If the glaciers are melting, it can further lead to disasters like floods, glacial lake outburst floods, increase in mean sea level, etc. Similarly, the heat waves also affect the agriculture because, for example, various crop yields, example wheat, reduce. There are higher chances of food insecurity in vulnerable countries, especially the African countries, the Saharan region. It will further can increase the prices and can lead to inflation. The productivity of the outdoor workers will also be affected. There can be delay in transportation services. Industrial production will also be affected. Increased greenhouse gases because if there is a heat wave, we will be using more air conditions. We will be using more refrigerators. So higher release of greenhouse gases also. Further, it also has a very high health cost increase in emergency services which in turn will increase the hospital admissions people will be having contaminated waters etc so basically all the aspects of life are affected by these disasters like heat waves and that is why imd time to time gives periodic warning now it is our duty that we should be aware about those warnings and take the adequate steps for ourselves as well as for our families so this was whole in relation to the heat waves in this session we have discussed that how the previous year questions have been asked on the color coded warning systems we discussed the criteria that on the basis of which criteria imd declares that a particular region is experiencing a heat wave we discussed that what are the essential concepts and what is the basic science behind this heat waves in this relation also read about the heat domes then we discuss the color coded warning system given by IMD and which is basically three color that is green, yellow and orange. As soon as we move from green towards orange, the intensity of the heat wave increases and so should our action also. In the last we discuss that what are the various impacts of heat wave in terms of environment, agriculture, transport, economy as well as health. Now moving towards our next article. The article is titled A Ground View of the Indian Space Policy 2023. Now this is also a very important topic because government has come up with new Indian Space Policy 2023. This topic has appeared at page number 8 in today's The Hindu Daily Edition and this is the very context of this article also. Now therefore in today's session we are going to learn the key facets of the India Space Policy 2023. So first what is the vision of this policy because this vision is very important and will help you to understand that why certain facts or certain key features have been accommodated in this particular policy the vision clearly states that this policy india space policy of 2023 aims to increase the commercial presence in the space sector of india and for this it aims to leverage the complete potential of the private sector and therefore, Indian Space Policy 2023 views private sector as a critical stakeholder in the entire value chain which that means that this policy aims to tap the potential of the private players at each and every stage of the space industry. And through this policy, it aims to have socio-economic development of the country as well as, as well as to meet the security demands. With the space technology, it also aims to protect the environment as well as lives, pursue the peaceful exploration of the outer space and stimulation of the public awareness and scientific quest. So if you closely look at all these parameters, you can see that this policy is a holistic policy as far as the India's space advancements are concerned. And to achieve all these objectives, the policy says that the government shall focus on research and development as far as the space technologies newer inventions are concerned 
the government shall also focus on providing the public goods and services using the space technology further it should also focus on stabilizing the regulatory framework with clear guidelines to provide a level playing field to the non government entities now what are these ngos these are basically the private players so in this particular policy the private players are termed as non government entities further government should also focus on space related education innovation as well as to develop the startups which are involved in the space industry to achieve all these things there are clear cut roles which are assigned to various government entities so in this policy if you closely see there are some roles which are for the government entities then there are certain roles for the private companies so we shall discuss both these dimensions in much detail so there are four government agencies in this regard isro department of space in space as well as nsil that is new space india limited now as we all know that presently isro was the leading stakeholder when it comes to the india's space industry but now this policy envisions basically it aims to shift the role of isro from manufacturing and operational space systems to conduct the research and development programs which means that this policy tries to emphasize that now isro's primary role will be research and development and not the manufacturing and operational aspects for example isro will be involved in such programs similar to mangalyaan gaganyaan chandrayaan etc department of space has been tasked to implement the policy as well as establish a framework for the safe and sustainable space operations so because this is an independent department and that is why it will implement in the unbiased manner further in space is to act as a single window agency for authorizing the space activities by the government entities as well as non government entities now this is very important the role of in space is in relation to the government as well as the non government entities nsil will look after commercializing of various space technologies and therefore it has been provided with the mandate to manufacture lease or procure the space components technologies platforms and other assets from the private or the public sector on sound commercial principles so basically nsil will look at the commercial aspects in space is the single window agency for both the types of entities department of space is the overall organization to implement the policy and establish regulatory framework and isro is to conduct the research and development things now come to the role of private companies first now they are allowed to undertake end to end space activity now this is very important in the beginning also we discussed that private players are now involved at each and every stage of the value chain of the space industry therefore they are allowed to undertake end to end space activity like launching operating the satellites developing the rockets creating ground station building space ports providing services like communication remote sensing navigation nationally as well as internationally etc further it is also said that satellites could be self owned procured or leased communication services could be over india or outside a very important point further the remote sensing data could be disseminated in india or abroad again a very important point because data localization is a very important theme in today's current affairs next it says private entities have also been encouraged to develop a space situational awareness capabilities which will be aimed to track the objects in the space and avoid any collision of satellites thereby removing or lessening the chances of space debris or space junks further the private players can now make filings with the international telecommunication union and engage in the commercial recovery of the asteroid resources again very important point private players are also allowed for the commercial recovery of the asteroid resources so these are certain role which are assigned in this policy for the private players but then there are certain issues also the first and the foremost issue is that there is no time frame 
the policy has set out an ambitious role for various organizations but still it has not provided for any schedule to create the regulatory framework so this is one of the biggest issue the second biggest issue is that a regulatory body needs a legislative authority if we see any regulatory body it has the legislative competence it has the legislative mandate through which it gains independence and increase in the efficiency but in space which is tasked with such a huge burden of work its position is still ambiguous because it has not got any legislative authority it still functions under the purview of the department of space so there is a need to increase the autonomous status of these organizations so that they can work in the most efficient manner when it comes to the space industry so these were the things related to the indian space policy 2023 let us revive this topic in brief once again the vision is a very holistic in nature and it aims to increase the commercial presence and increasing the role of private players in the entire value chain of the space economy and for this it says that government should focus on research and development providing public goods establishing a regulatory framework and focusing on the startups related to the space sector therefore it lays down certain roles on government as well as private entities for example the government entities like isro department of space in space nsil all these government bodies are assigned with specific responsibilities similarly the space sector has been opened up for the private companies and the role has been assigned that they can undertake end to end space activity develop a space situational awareness capability as well as commercial recovery of the asteroid resources in the end we discuss that still despite the fact that this is ambitious in nature there are certain loopholes for example no schedule and no time frame is there in the policy and the bodies are not given the required legislative authority our last topic today is from the context of the uprisings of 1857 the 1857 revolt now generally in newspapers very less topics appear from the history section but if it appears then it's our responsibility that we shall do that so in today's newspaper at the text and the context page the topic has appeared in the context of 1857 revolt so that is why in today's session we will revise that what was the background and causes of the revolt of 1857 then we'll see that what were the reasons that why this revolt was not successful why this revolt could not bring us the independence from the british raj and then despite certain failures what were the consequences of this particular revolt so let us begin our today's session first let us understand that what was the background before the 1857 revolt we all know that before 1857 the company has already garnered its position it had got a strong hold as far as several territories of india were concerned and it had taken various policy measures which were detrimental for the social economic as well as cultural life of india so we need to understand that in what background in what context this revolt was started and how these long term reasons for the last 100 years ended in the form of 1857 widespread revolt first let us look at the economic situation economic background of the economic reasons now peasantry peasants farmers at that time also were one of the most significant sections of india but the situation of farmers was very bad in that particular area because of various revenue policies various landlord models like zamindari systems higher taxation higher tariff policies etc and therefore the profit margins of farmers were deteriorating at a very rapid scale and, and there was a widespread anger as far as the peasantry or farmer situation was concerned there were several revolts there were the farmers were not getting the right price for their products they were not getting the right market for their products they were also forced to certain crops for example indigo which suited british interest rather than the farmer interests further because of the deindustrialization policies the artisans degradation was also there the british took the policies of mechanization and industrialization 
and this mechanization policies was detrimental for the india's own traditional handicraft industries and that is why it is said that the modern industries which were brought by british was also responsible for the deindustrialization of india not the industrialization and now you should understand that once the deindustrialization was in process that means that industries were not earning some profits that means the workers or the labor class were not getting the employment also so if the workers and laborers are not going into industries the only option left with them it is to come back to the agriculture and this is one of the reason that why agriculture has the problem of disguised unemployment so all the factors resulted into poor economic situation of india we all are aware about the drain of wealth now come to the defense reasons yes the company's forces army had a significant proportions of indian men but then they were not paid accordingly let's let us assume that the a is the indian soldier and b is the european soldier sharing the same rank that means they have the same position same authority same power and same responsibility despite this fact the british soldier was paid higher compared to the indian counterpart and therefore there was a widespread discrimination at the soldier's rank when it come to the salary as well as rank the indian soldiers were not promoted easily compared to the british soldiers further we all are aware about the greased cartridges which were brought by the british which hurt the sentiments of hindus as well as muslims both there was also a judicial discrimination for the same punishment the indian soldiers were penalized with a higher degree and also because indian soldiers were sent across borders they were sent to the far lands traveling across the ocean so it also led to resentment in the indian soldiers especially hindus because it was against their because at that time it was believed that the person who has crossed the oceans or the seas he has become polluted so in a way it also hurt cultural feelings of hindus as well as muslims then comes the british policies the alien nature of british so because of all those policies which were been implemented by british in india the indians slowly and gradually get to know that the british are alien they do not belong to this land and they never wanted to get accustomed to the indian policies indian traditions indian feelings further their political policies for example doctrine of lapse we all are aware about this that if there is no legal hire of any indian king all his kingdom will be transferred automatically to the british empire so because of doctrine of lapse also the rani of jhansi took the command in her control and led the revolt because all the empire all the kingdom of jhansi was taken by the british under this policy of doctrine of lapse similarly modernizations of railways posts etc were also aimed to suit the british interests only similarly there were cultural reasons british tried to interfere in the indian culture for example they enacted sati law widow remarriage laws etc though these laws were forward looking they were modern but at that point of time they also hurt the cultural feelings of indians and that is why indians took arms against the british and last but not the least the political reasons downgrading of the princely states taking all the powers from them their expansionist tendencies subsidiary alliance etc all these things eventually led to the revolt of 1857 various kings various landlords zamindars and normal public they came together and revolted against the british empire but despite this we all know that it was not in 1857 when india got independent it was in 1947 almost 90 years later so despite this resentment despite several kings and powerful people coming together why was it that india could not succeed india could not gain the independence the reason was one this revolt was not well organized the tactics participation the growth it was not properly scheduled there was a leadership problem leaders were weak there were lack of communication the approach and the tactics were very traditional 
and seven kings as well as queens were fighting for their self interest their aim was not to make the whole india as independent but their main aim was to take back their own kingdom to fight for their own respect so that is why some people say that this revolt was fueled by personal motives personal emotion and personal feelings and this is why this revolt was not pan india rather it was limited in approach it was regional in nature restricted mainly to the gangatic plains so there was no concept of nationalism by then and british was not considered as a common enemy several indian kings supported british also so in a way indians were fighting against indians only there was a very limited support from the zamindars labor middle class princely states etc so yes several kings came together but when it has to be seen on a pan india scale there was no support the tribals didn't come in support with the kings because before 1857 it was in the hands of various kingdoms because of which the tribals have faced a lot of miseries so even tribals didn't support the kings there was a limited unity different aims and objectives and it was not planned it was a sudden outbreak so these were the factors which led to the failure of the 1857 revolt but then there were certain important consequences after this revolt the british changed their policies also for example british adopted no interference policy because british gradually came to know that it is because they interfered in day to day matters of kingdoms kings queens and normal people and that is why it fueled the anger among india so that is why they adopted no interference policy that now onwards we will not interfere with indians and let them they do their own work but in reality this policy was never followed because the british kept on increasing kept on interfering with the normal day to day lives normal political matters judicial matters matters related to army law formulations etc further 1857 revolt saw a marked unity between hindus and muslims were aware that if these hindus and muslims come together then it will be a very big problem for them and that is why they adopted divide and rule policy they will create friction between these two largest communities of india so that they will fight against each other so there was a change in policies further at the political front also the rule was shifted from company to the crown that is the british queen no more expansion the government of india act 1858 was passed the position of viceroy was created this was created in order to deal directly with the kings with the princely states and several reforms were taken in the areas of police law judiciary bureaucratic etc the governor general was to make the overall economic policy in the military sphere also different regiments were constructed based on caste religion region etc the number of indians were reduced and the number of europeans were increased because again british were very clever they were very aware about the fact that if there are higher number of indians in the british army and 20 years or 30 years down the line again if there is some revolt so the indian soldiers might revolt against the british empire so that is why they reduced the number of indians and increased the number of europeans they con- they started the concept of martial races their defense spending rose in order to have a strong defense systems so these were certain consequences or certain changes in policies which british took in the post 1857 period further in the context of india also there were certain important impacts of this revolt one there was a rise of middle class intelligentsia political reformers came to the forefront and therefore you will see that after 1857 just about 30 years later indian national congress inc was born and before inc also there were several political organizations which were working for the upliftment for the social economic cause of various people there was a political awakening the normal masses came to know that there is someone who has captured us who is ruling us and that someone is not from india that is a foreign one 
so eventually it led to the idea of nationalism the feeling of nationalism among the indians so these were some of the important consequences of 1857 revolt so that was all for today all the very best and study hard